Okay, in this video, I am going to um, illustrate how to carry out uh, several um, HLM models using SPSS when you have repeated measures data. Um, in my previous video, I demonstrated how to convert data from a wide format to a vertical format for this type of modeling. And uh, what I'm going to be using are examples that are drawn from Heck et al.'s uh, book, multi-level and longitudinal modeling with IBM SPSS. Um, and specifically what I'm going to utilize is um, the authors, um, the data set provided by the authors on their uh, book website. So in this video, um, you know, our, uh, I'm going to mainly focus on uh, illustrating uh, a null model that incorporates no predictors of variation in students' test scores over time, and then also model um, uh, um, trend components associated with uh, students' test scores over time, or basically looking, uh, testing, you know, what kind of um, uh, trend, whether it be linear or quadratic, might better fit uh, the students' uh, growth trajectories. So the data set, uh, as you see, we have a variable uh, which is uh, ID, and so this is a student level identifier. Students are essentially falling at level two, and we have repeated measurements. Uh, on their test scores at level one. So we have, you know, for each student, we have a time one test score, time two test score, time three test score. So we have test one, test two, test three for student one, student two, student three, and so forth. You'll notice that we have an index variable which is reflecting really each measurement occasion, and this was created during uh, 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 the last step um, in the last video I showed you. We also have a time variable which is derived from the index variable. It's just basically uh, taking the index variable and subtracting one, and we have a time variable. Um, and then the quad time is essentially taking uh, the square of the time variable. And so this is uh, to potentially model a quadratic um, trends in the student's uh, growth curves. So the first demonstration in, um, in their book, um, in chapter five, um, basically is a null model that involves no, um, no predictors. So what we're going to do is, uh, just to kind of follow along with that, I'm going to go to Analyze, Mixed Models, go to Linear. Um, when this box opens up, I'm going to move my Level 2 identifier over, so the student or between uh, person identifier. And then I'm going to move uh, my index variable over to the repeated box. Now when I do this, this, this uh, repeated covariance type uh, uh, box highlights. And so there's actually a drop down, and this is pertaining to your assumptions about the residuals um, uh, uh, that are uh, generated from the model, whether those residuals uh, are correlated or not, uh, and whether or not they exhibit uh, differences in variation over uh, time. So uh, that's essentially what this box uh, is. And so there are various uh, covariance types that we might assume. So there are various covariance structures that we could assume. So, you know, when you think about a covariance uh, matrix, just keep in mind that, you know, when we, you know, let's say we've got three time points. We've got time one, we got time two, and time three. And so when we, uh, so we could look at uh, the error uh, variances and covariances in this context. So we, we could make assumptions about, you know, when we look at the principal diagonal, these are reflecting variances. So we've got variance for time one, variance for time two, and we have variance for time three. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and denote these as, you know, basically subscripted one, one, reflecting row one, column one, uh, We'll, we'll have this one as 2, 2, reflecting row 2, column 2, 3, 3, reflecting row 3, column 3. Then the covariance uh, that's computed will be, in this case, uh, the sigma with a little subscript 2, 1, reflecting the covariance in errors uh, between time 1 and time 2, uh, sigma 3, 1, row 3, column 1, which is reflecting uh, uh, covariance uh, in errors between time 1 and time 3, and then we have right here, we've got uh, 3, 2, which is reflecting uh, the covariance between errors between times 2 and 3. And then obviously, uh, these are reproduced above um, the principal diagonal. Okay, so the deal is, is that um, 
what we are, are going to do is we have to make some kind of assumption about the covariance structure within this matrix. And so um, the default that kind of popped up right here is a diagonal matrix. And what that basically implies is that when it comes to uh, the principal diagonal, um, the variances um, are uh, not necessarily equal. So the, the, vari the residual variances at times 1, 2, and 3 uh, are not assumed to be equal, uh, whereas the off-diagonal elements are all um, essentially assumed to be zero, meaning that there's no covariation um, between um, the errors um, between the time points. So that's what a diagonal matrix is. And so in this case, we would be estimating three unique parameters from this model. We would have the variance at time one, time two, and time three. Uh, another type of um, covariance structure that we might uh, adopt, and what they, the authors use as a default, is a scaled identity. And then in this case, what we have is a matrix where um, the principal diagonal is um, for this, for the the uh, matrix are, are is ones. The off diagonal elements are all zeros, and we're essentially multiplying the elements of the matrix times a common variance. So, in other words, we're sort of pooling the variances, and we're treating really all of the variances as being equal. So, there's only one uh, variance estimate associated with um, this type of uh, matrix. So really, in, in both of these cases, the diagonal and the scaled identity matrices, what we're assuming is, is that the errors between time points are not correlated. Uh, but whereas with a scaled identity matrix, we're assuming that uh, a common variance across time points with the uh, diagonal matrix, we don't make that uh, sort of restrictive assumption. Another possible uh, type, just really quickly, is unstructured. And so an unstructured uh, covariance matrix just basically implies that um, all of the elements in the principal diagonal are, uh, are um, not assumed to be uh, homogeneous. So in other words, we're assuming uh, the possibility that the variances uh, across the time points are not equal, and then the covariances are not equal between the, the, the two time points. So um, and in that case, that's a, a very, um, you know, that's not nearly as a restrictive uh, assumption about the pattern of variances and covariances, but the downside is, is that you're estimating more parameters, and so um, with an unstructured matrix, you can run into a greater likelihood of there being, um, you know, kind of estimation problems. So, um, but that's the unstructured option that you see right here. So um, there are also other types of uh, examples, as, uh, matrices as well, that we're not going to focus on right now. So we're going to stick with the scaled identity matrix, which is what the authors um, use in their uh, textbook uh, as part of their first example. So in this case, we're going to click on continue, and under here, we're going to move test score over to the dependent box. Um, we're not really going to do anything under fix. We're just, you know, we're just going to assume that we're, we're going to be estimating uh, an intercept across individuals, which is, you know, essentially what's going to happen is, is that each individual intercept, uh, because we don't have any predictors in the model, is going to be the mean for that person over time. Um, and so the fixed component um, that we are going to uh, be estimating right here, th that fixed component is the average of the person averages. Uh, under random, we're going to move ID over here, and so we're going to allow the intercepts, uh, the person level intercepts to vary uh, over, um, over the persons. Uh, the covariance type, to be consistent with the text presentation, we're going to go ahead and select scaled identity, even though um, this is basically going to give us the same thing as the variance components solution. Click on continue, and then under estimation, we have the uh, method. We're going to use restricted maximum likelihood in this demonstration, uh, which, is, again, um, is consistent with the presentation in the text. Uh, but, you know, there's obviously maximum likelihood. And if we wanted to compare models using uh, the various, uh, the deviant statistics and so forth, uh, we would want to use this estimation method. But we're going to stick with the restricted uh, method. And then under statistics, we'll ask for parameter estimates, tests of uh, covariance parameters, and covariances of random effects. So um, at any rate, we'll click on continue and then on OK. And so now what we see uh, in our output, we've got um, 
uh, you know, identity matrices specified for the covariance structures. Uh, the number of parameters uh, is going to be one in each case because we're estimating uh, a common variance of the residuals for the repeated effects. And then uh, for the random effects, we have just the, uh, the uh, variance of the intercept that we're estimating. And then we also have the, um, the grand mean of the intercepts across the individuals. Um, so kind of scrolling down, you'll see we've got the information criteria box, which is basically that those uh, fit measures that I was telling you about, which is really more useful in the context of a maximum likelihood estimation. And so we're not really going to focus on that uh, in this context. As you scroll down, you'll see we have estimates of fixed effects. We've got the intercept. So this is the grand mean of the person level means, uh, which is uh, 52.94. We have repeated measures variance estimate, which is 78. This is at level one. And then we have the level two variance estimate for the intercepts. And both of these are statistically significant. Uh, remember that when it comes to the variance estimates, technically the correct p-value is half of what you see printed out right down here. So, but given that both of them are significant at the uh, less than 0 0.001 level, we're not going to uh, worry about that. So that's essentially the a null model that includes no predictors. Uh, another alternative uh, to the null model is one that incorporates uh, the time components. So basically kind of modeling the time trajectory. And so this is their presentation of model 1.1a uh, in their uh, uh, book. So we'll go to analyze mixed models and linear. And so in this particular demonstration, um, you know, they basically are sticking with the, uh, um, the uh, scaled identity as the covariance type uh, at uh, level one. And then they also say, well, let's, let's look at modeling a, um, a quadratic trend. Uh, and, you know, really when you looked at the, uh, in, in, in the previous video, um, my first video, I kind of illustrated that it looked like that a lot of the growth trajectories uh, for the uh, individuals in the study exhibited a quadratic trend. And so, um, so given that, uh, it might make sense to then model that. So we're going to click on continue. And in this case, we're going to move time over to the covariate box and then quad time over to that box. Okay, so basically we're going to have then a fixed effect for um, uh, the linear and quadratic components um, for, for this uh, analysis. So next I'm going to click on fixed and move these variables over to the fixed box uh, um, right here. So I'm going to click on add right here. And then um, at this point, really there's nothing else that we're going to change and we're just going to click on OK. And so now when we look at our analysis, you'll notice that um, again we have our identity covariance matrix, uh, covariance structures uh, at level one, level two, we have our, um, you know, the number of parameters. We have the uh, the um, uh, uh, grand mean of the intercepts across individuals. Now the deal is, is that because we've added in a time variable, remember the intercept is essentially the predicted value on y when x is equal to zero, or your x's are equal to zero. So what this by virtue of adding in a time variable and and our quad time, where we essentially have uh, a value of zero reflecting the starting point, then the intercept for each person actually becomes their um, initial starting uh, value on the uh, test variable. So it's basically their time one scores. So um, that's all that's happening. So we're essentially taking then the, when we uh, estimate the intercept, we're estimating the uh, average uh, of the um, uh, individual's time one uh, scores. We also have then the regression coefficient for time and the quad time uh, variables. So when we scroll down, um, you can see that in terms of the estimates of fixed effects, there's our intercept. So this is the average of the time one scores. And you can see it's a little bit lower than what it was previously. And that's, you know, again, that's reflecting the fact that we're, we're capturing, you know, the average at time one. You also, so you'll also see the time variable. This is the uh, coefficient. So, and you can see that this is statistically significant in the model, which indicates that, um, you know, that there is a significant linear component. But then when we look at the quad time, you can see that this coefficient is statistically significant as well, which actually then is suggesting that really a quadratic trend is um, 
you know, a better fit to the, uh, the individual growth curves than just a linear trend. So it looks like there is, um, you know, and essentially you could look at uh, this variable right here as sort of uh, reflecting the idea that the linear trends are changing over time as well. So that's where you end up with uh, curvature in the, um, the growth curves. So, so the model at this point is suggesting uh, uh, that uh, quadratic uh, trends are better describe the growth curves within the, within, uh, the model than, than just a linear trend. When we look at the individual growth parameters, you can see, or the uh, covariance parameters, uh, you can see, again, the variance estimate at level one, the repeated, uh, assuming a common uh, um, variance uh, structure for uh, each of the time points, that's still statistically significant, as well as the variance of the intercepts. Okay, so that's, you know, that covers sort of the basic um, um, null models um, that are possible. Uh, you know, another possibility is that we could uh, also find ourselves being interested in modeling uh, variation in the um, predictors. Uh, so, in other words, trying to model variation in the, the slopes uh, of either the time or the quadratic um, um, uh, components of our, of our trend. And uh, I'm not really going to do that right now. I'm going to actually save that for the next video. So, that covers uh, this discussion of um, at least modeling the fixed effects uh, of uh, time on um, uh, variation over time in the repeated measurement test scores.